the world, including many of its supposed experts, was overwhelmingly thinking just about negative side effects and not about benefits. Hey, Nick Nanton here, and thanks for tuning in to Now to Next. I want to make sure you don't miss a single episode of this show on YouTube. So before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, just go into your settings and switch on notifications. Thanks for watching. Hey, everyone. Nick Nanton here uh, with my friend Alex Epstein. Uh, I would do his intro before saying anything to him, but you can see him. I can see him. It's just awkward not to acknowledge him. So, Alex, how's it going, man? Hey, hey Nick. Hey, everyone who's watching. It's glad to have you. All right, I'm going to give a brief intro, then we'll dig into a fascinating conversation, guys. I've got one today I think you're really going to enjoy. Um, Alex has what I would call an unpopular viewpoint, uh, not because it's wrong. I don't, I don't know if it's right or wrong. I actually – he makes a lot of really great arguments. It's just uh, – there's a lot to digest here. So we're going to dig in. I'll give you a brief intro. and We'll dig into a great conversation. If anyone has any questions, feel free uh, to put them in the comments. You might have some questions that I haven't thought of. But here we go. Briefly, uh, Alex Epstein uh, is an author and commentator who advocates for the use of fossil fuels. That's why I say he's not popular. Instead of the non-use of fossil fuels, which is the greening movement is more popular right now. The unpopular view is that we should use more fossil fuels, which is, Alex makes a very convincing argument for. He is the founder and president uh, of the Center for Industrial Progress, a for-profit think tank that seeks to improve the planet through the use of technology. He is the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, which came out in 2014. The book has been praised as the most persuasive argument ever made for our continuing use of fossil fuels, uh, winning him the most original thinker of 2014 award from the McLaughlin Group. Um, Alex has made his moral case for fossil fuels at dozens of campuses, including Harvard, Yale, Stanford, and his alma mater, Duke. He has also spoken to employees and leaders at dozens of Fortune 500 energy companies. His latest book, which is what we're going to talk about today, is called Fossil Future, in which he provides systematic analysis of our energy, environmental, and climate future from a human flourishing perspective. Again, Alex, thanks so much for joining us today. Man, this thanks, book Nick. is, uh, it's my pleasure, man. This book's tough, dude. I mean, this is a heady subject, right? I mean, and it's a, it's a heady subject that even when I bring it up, when I'm reading this book with friends of mine of all persuasions, um, I find myself trying to defend your argument, which I think is great, but I'm not equipped well enough to do it. Like, it's sort of like, well, yeah, I can't quite explain that as well as Alex does read the book, uh, which you do, you can't always get detractors of an idea to actually hear out both sides. I think that's like a common uh, issue with bias. Tell me a little bit about how you got into energy policy in the first place. And then let's dig in a little bit about some of the per very persuasive arguments you make here, as well as some of the I'm also interested in, we talked a little bit before we came on camera, some of the difficulty with this, some of the maybe the, the personal toll it takes trying to be a truth sayer in an unpopular space. So first of all, how did you get even into sort of digging into energy and what was really going on? All right, lots, lots of interesting stuff there. So, so one thing is just in terms of, yeah, this book is, it's a long book. If people can see it. There's a lot of stuff there. But if people want a preview, you can get, they make, you know, fake previews on Amazon. People sell them for like $4 that they make or something. Don't read those. Just go to energytalkingpoints.com, one of my websites, and search Fossil Future. And I have a summary, so you can believe it. And you can read it in 10 minutes. So it's my summary, so it's pretty accurate. So people are interested. So uh, I got into energy as, you know, from primarily a philosophy background. So I think of myself as a philosopher first, energy expert second. And so what a philosopher, I think properly is at least, is an expert on the basic ideas that shape our thinking and our action. And one big thing is philosophers are supposed to think about thinking methods. When, when we're approaching a subject, I know you're also a Dan Sullivan fan, he'll say something about, you know, you need to think about your thinking. And usually what people do with the subject is they, they'll jump into it and they'll start making arguments or they'll, they'll align themselves with a party or some, you know, some group versus stepping back and saying, hey, how do I think about this subject? And so one rule, if you're thinking about what to do about any technology, is you need to carefully weigh both the benefits and the negative side effects of that technology. And what I found 15 years ago when I just learned a little bit about fossil fuels is that the world, including many of its supposed experts, 
was overwhelmingly thinking just about negative side effects and not about benefits. And, and I learned, for example, that oil, you know, which is hated, I mean, people hate it in theory, of course, they use it more and more in practice. Uh, but you know, oil, part of the reason it's so dominant is, is it has this very valuable feature called energy density, which is that it stores a lot of energy in a small amount of space. And this is why it's used overwhelmingly for airplanes, for cargo ships, and to feed the world via agricultural machines like combine harvesters that reap and thresh wheat. And I realize when people are talking about fossil fuels, they don't talk about these benefits, even though fossil fuels are crucial to food. And you know, another example in which they're crucial to food is natural gas. Natural gas is the basis of modern fertilizer. And yet I noticed that these experts who were talking about getting rid of fossil fuels, they weren't acknowledging the benefits of fossil fuels. And I thought if you're if you're talking about getting rid of something without acknowledging its benefits, you're going to make really bad decisions. And I think that line of thinking has been vindicated by today's global energy crisis, where we have a short shortage of fossil fuels, which now everyone wants. And we're seeing that manifest in higher agricultural prices, the inability of Europe to heat itself in winter, the fear of that, you know, skyrocketing food prices, people worried about starvation, because we haven't seriously considered the benefits of fossil fuels before taking action to restrict their availability. The, you mentioned a shortage of fossil fuels. Are we, because I think what everyone worries about is my children's children's children won't have any more oil and they're all starve and die, right? There's some vision we have of like Armageddon when when we build a society based on fossil fuels and they're no longer available. So I don't think that's what you mean when you're talking about a shortage today. It's, it's, a, it's a supply shortage essentially based on- Well, it's a, it's a yeah. Right? So, so, I mean, historically there are three basic worries from fossil fuels. The most dominant one is right now actually it's climate impact, which we can definitely talk about. Uh, but another one is they'll lead to a level of pollution that's just really debilitating. That one has mostly been alleviated because you can see in the US we have more fossil fuel energy than ever, but less pollution. So people are kind of aware of that. And then there's the one you're referring to, which is the resource depletion, which is, okay, it's fossil fuels. It comes mostly from ancient dead life. And so we're going to run out of, you know, we're going to run out of that. Uh, you know, what's actually, so what I talk about in fossil future is, you know, we have more than 10 times as much of all the fossil fuels in the ground as we've used in, in all of human history. So in terms of the deposits, there's no issue. Uh, there's a question of how many, how much of them you can get cost effectively, but we have better and better technology. But the real limiting factor is political. Are we allowed to invest in it? Are we allowed to produce fossil fuel? Are we allowed to transport it? And that's what's caused today's shortages. So these are politically induced shortages, not you know like nature induced shortages. And what's happened really interestingly is we're not, it's the anti-fossil fuel movement hasn't even succeeded at lowering the amount of fossil fuel use. So we actually use more fossil fuel than ever, but they've restricted the growth by opposing investment, by opposing production, by opposing transportation. And people can think of different examples like shutting down pipelines or preventing fracking in Europe or you know, different financial institutions refusing to invest. Those things have restricted the growth of fossil fuel in a world that needs far more energy and it needs most of it from fossil fuel because of the unique attributes of fossil fuels. And what's happened there is just because of just because we've slowed the growth, we've created a global energy crisis where we have these skyrocketing prices. So people act like, oh, fossil fuels are no longer cheap. No, no, no. They could be plenty cheap, but we've restricted them. And so what if that should really call into question if just restricting the growth of fossil fuels has caused a global crisis that's really terrorizing the world right now. What does it mean to pursue this fossil fuel elimination agenda that until the last year or two people thought was common sense? Yeah, so one of the things I think is important to point out too, you are not uh, a climate change denier. Let's talk a little bit about, you said it's sort of the dominant argument and obviously the big place where, the way everyone is framing this argument right now is climate change. So tell me a little bit about what you've studied in climate change, how, how we're being taught that we should be thinking about it, but from thinking about your thinking, how you think we should be thinking about it. So, so the main thing we need to be thinking in terms of quote, climate change is we need to be thinking about it a lot more carefully. And in particular, we need to think of it as a side effect of fossil fuel use. So when people just, they talk about climate change as this isolated issue, you know, I care about climate change. What do we do about climate change? But that's like saying, 
I care about prescription drug side effects. What do we do about prescription drug side effects? But if you're looking at prescription drugs, you need to look at the benefits and the side effects. You're not going to make a good decision if you're just looking at the side effects. And if someone was just looking at the side effects of prescription drugs, you would suspect that they would be exaggerating those side effects, particularly negative side effects, because they're ignoring the benefits. An analogy I use is, you know, imagine somebody has a mother-in-law who's given, you know, them a million dollars, and all he does is complain about the mother-in-law, and he never mentions the million dollars. Well, you could think, well, his complaints probably are exaggerated because he didn't mention this huge benefit he got from the mother-in-law. And so, you know, not it's not a perfect analogy because fossil fuels, you know, are probably overall better than most people's mother-in-laws in a lot of a lot of cases. But uh, the, if if somebody is exact is is not is ignoring benefits, they're probably exaggerating side effects. And I think you find both of these with fossil fuels and climate. So the huge benefit that's ignored with climate, and this is really criminal intellectually, is we ignore the way in which fossil fuels allow us to what I call master climate danger, to take some danger and neutralize it. So if you take drought, people are worried about, well, fossil fuels will cause more drought, but they don't talk about how fossil fuels allow us to alleviate drought, even though they demonstrably give us an incredible ability to alleviate drought through things like irrigation and crops tra crop transport. And those things have lowered drought-related death by 99 plus percent in the last 100 years. So you're less than you know one in 100 likelihood to die from a drought from a drought than you used to be. And yet people think of drought as getting worse. So the huge thing people ignore is the climate related benefits of fossil fuels. They only look at the negatives. And then with the negatives, I talk about a lot in a lot of detail, people tend to just have these crazy views that everything in the world will get worse because we impact climate. I do believe we impact climate because CO2 is a warming gas. So we'd expect it to have some of a warming effect, but people assume that's all bad, which is really weird because far more people die of cold than of heat in the world. And warming takes place more in cold places than in hot places. This is according to the mainstream science. And then they assume that every single weather thing will get worse. So it'll get you know more rain, so more storms, but also more drought and in all the wrong places. So it's, it really has this religious quality where we're treating our climate impact as a sin versus just as a scientific phenomenon. And we just assume that the nature God or the climate is going to punish us versus looking in a clinical way at, hey, where is this beneficial? Where is this harmful? And ultimately, I think none of it matters all that much compared to our ability to deal with climate danger, because our ability to deal with climate danger is so good and expanding that it's really actually hard to think of a climate problem that we could cause that we couldn't overcome. Yeah, you, you've created, or at least I haven't heard it before reading your book, you know, some of this language around sort of like the human flourishing scale, and, and perhaps we should be looking at, you know, how do fossil fuels help us flourish? You know, just you've, you've brought up, I, obviously, look, this issue is politicized. Um, it seems like, I mean, so many issues get politicized. Why do you, what's your take on why this issue has become political? Well, in a sense, the issue should be political because the the main question is what do we do about you know the side of, the the real question people are concerned about with I mean in general technologies if they have potentially adverse side effects you have to think about what does the law do about these uh, so that's a legitimate thing I mean you just think about standard pollution you take something like the the valley in Los Angeles there's a legitimate question of okay we got all these cars and the topography here leads to the buildup of smog. You know, do we want to do something about this? And if so, what should we do such that we can have cleaner air, but we can still drive around? We still have all the values of mobility. So that's a le legitimate thing to think about politically. And the same thing with our climate impacts. If you don't, if you haven't analyzed it, you need to think about how significant are these, how negative are they, what are the benefits that come along with them. So it, it should be political. Uh, but I think it it the sense in which it's politicized that's bad is it is it becomes this very partisan issue where people are thinking about it in a very tribal way versus thinking about it in a in a just in a kind of clinical way and unfortunately there's this party division where it's okay the republicans are the ones who are supposedly pro fossil fuels and the democrats are anti fossil fuels and one thing i try to do is get people in whatever their political affiliation to think differently about fossil fuels because it's, it, I mean, right now, for example, there are certain things I agree with Democrats on, but there's, I think they're really, really destructive on, on energy. 
and and I'm trying to persuade a lot of them to to change their views. It doesn't, you know, in the past, Democrats were very pro industry. We're not all what I call climate uh, catastrophists, and so yeah, unfortunately, it becomes it, it has this. It, it it's very partisan, and then unfortunately, the issue of science is linked to the anti fossil fuel position, which I think is really dangerous because it's ultimately not a scientific position. I think it's ultimately a religious position. Uh, but I think sometimes people have reacted to it by saying there's no climate change or we don't impact climate at all. And that's that's a wrong way of defending fossil fuels. And part of what I'm doing is stepping above that and saying, no, we do impact climate, but those impacts insofar as they're negative are nowhere near as important as the benefits of fossil fuels. Yeah. And let's talk about it from your framework of, of human flourishing. And I mean, we've already talked about how we need to, we can't just throw out the positives and just look at the negatives, but you've really named it uh, from my point of view, you know, just human flourishing and let's, let's judge based on, on how human beings are progressing in society, how, how, what the death rate is, where it's going down to. And, and I think, so I'll let you address that. And I also think the, the point you make in the very beginning of the book where you talk about you know, a medical issue in an African village without enough energy is like a very, it's a great analogy if you want to share that of like what happens when you don't have reliable energy. Sure. So the, so I've been talking about in general, the issue of, of looking at benefits and side effects, positive and negative, but there is this issue, you know, positives and negatives. There's this issue underlying that, which people don't even think about at all, is how are you measuring? positive and negative when you're talking about things. And, and I'll first use the example of climate. When people say we're in a climate crisis, what's their standard of measurement, or as I call it, standard of evaluation? And one thing I point out is that if you, if you look at it from what I call a human flourishing standard, so how good is the world in term of, terms of its hospil, hospitability to human beings living long, healthy, opportunity-filled lives, Climate is actually better than ever. We can quantify the rate at which people die from climate disasters, and it's gone down 98% over the last 100 years. So that includes extreme temperatures, storms, floods, et cetera. So we're actually far safer from climate than ever. We also derive far more climate benefits than ever. So we can enjoy a far wider range of climates. You know, we can enjoy, say, I like snowboarding and snowmobiling in Utah, you know, which that used to be a totally debilitating thing. That was like a, a, a totally almost uninhabitable place some of the year. And now it's a place you pay a lot of money to go to because we're, we have such a level of mastery. So from a human flourishing perspective, climate is in a better state than ever because let's say we've warmed it one degree, but overall it's there, there are positives and negatives to that, but overall, because we master it, we're in such better shape. And yet most of the people commenting on it think we're in a climate crisis now. They think that and that, that's how they describe it. And so my contention is they're not measuring the state of climate from a human flourishing perspective. They're actually measuring it from a lack of human impact perspective. The, the premise is that our impact is bad and we should be eliminating it. So when they look at climate, they say we've impacted climate and that's just wrong. It's not really wrong because it's bad for us, because overall it's clearly good for us, at least so far. We're much better off than we were before, but it's just, it's viewing it as wrong. It's like there's a commandment that says thou shalt not impact climate. And that's how people are judging climate issues. That's why they think it's a crisis, even though we're safer than ever. And I think overall, the modern environmental movement's view of the world has this lack of impact standard where they view the best world as the one where we impact it the least. And I view the best world as the one in which we're flourishing the most. And those are at odds because most of the time us flourishing requires significant impact. Even if you talk about, say, enjoying a forest or something like that, you need to impact the world a lot so that you have the time to go to that forest, so you have the access, so you have the tools. So this, this whole hostility toward human impact and viewing the world as we should impact as little as possible, I think that's distorting thinking. And I think it's ultimately why really smart people are against fossil fuels, because they don't really oppose it because it's bad for humans. They think of it as bad for the earth. But in their perspective, they think of the earth as the non-human earth. They think that we shouldn't impact the earth. It's wrong for us to be the dominant species. And they want a world in which we are a far lesser presence. 
and, and that's, I mean, at the end of the day, that's sort of where the arguments meet brass tacks, I would imagine from your point of view. It's like, you got to decide, like, perhaps you were never presented this idea, most people haven't been, that we should probably be measuring human flourishing. But if you're, if someone is unwilling to measure against the scale of, of, of anti-impact on the earth, there's there's really no middle ground it would seem right i mean it's just if you're just really yeah but friend. but very few people are so what's interesting is the more you make these issues explicit the fewer people are going to be in the anti what i call call on the anti-impact framework or the anti-human impact framework because I, I talk about this in chapter three of the book a lot of the way people adopt this anti-impact perspective is it gets disguised as pro-human so one way it gets disguised as pro-human is this, this, this idea that impact is self-destructive. We have this idea that if we impact the earth, it's eventually going to punish us. And so they're saying, no, 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 I love humans. I'm just telling you to reduce your impact because it's going to help you. And I, I explain this in a lot of detail and why it's, uh, but in chapter three, but the main thing is this is obviously false. So human beings impacted the earth very little in the last 200,000 years and life was terrible and life only got good when we impacted the planet a lot. And there's no inherent reason to think that impacting as such is gonna make things worse. Specific impacts can be bad, but in general, human beings impact the world in a productive way. We take some set of resources, this is just basic economics, and take some set of materials at least, and we make it more valuable. That's what we're always trying to do. That's what profit-making businesses are trying to do. That's what individuals who work in those businesses are at least indirectly trying to do. So it's just, in this so but but people think oh yeah impact is bad so we're going to destroy the delicate balance of nature and it's going to punish us so that's some people have that belief and then the other thing that comes up is people equate this idea of eliminating impact with eliminating negative impacts or human harming impacts so they think oh yeah i'm anti impact because i want clean air and clean water and so they're packaging together being against human harming impacts with being against all our impact. But then once you think of it from a human flourishing perspective, you think, no, no, wait, it's good for us to have factories and farms and clean air and clean water. And we can, we, but so the goal, we don't think of it in terms of impact is bad. We think of it in terms of pro-human is good. And that way, yeah, you limit or minimize your human harming impacts, but you get all the human helping impacts. And so once you clarify these issues, then more and more people get in the on team human, so to speak, because because then because then you really have to admit, I just want humans to die, like that. And my analogy is: imagine somebody said, "Hey Nick, I'm against bear impact. My mission in life is to minimize bear impact." What would you think their goal was? It's obviously they want to kill all the bears, right? And if they said, "No, no, 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 no," I just so that's really when it doesn't make any sense logically for a human to say, I want to kill all the humans. And that's why it needs to be discussed. Now, some people will still have this view, but it's really misanthropic in terms of just anti-human at the root. And I don't think it doesn't appeal to the masses, which is why nobody runs on it. They always run on, yeah, no, we're protecting ourselves from the looming disaster caused by our impact. Or yeah, we're just protecting clean air and clean water and, and hide all the ways in which we're stopping all of industry. Got it. Those of you just tuning in, uh, this is Alex Epstein. Uh, he has a new book out called Fossil Future, where he details a great argument that we need to use more, not less fossil fuels to continue human flourishing. And he addresses some of the impacts and how we can how we can minimize or or how we can I guess how we can make sure we're looking at the right things. We're going to have massive impact. But what can, what can we do to make sure that they're, I guess, healthy impacts the best we, we can? Alex, what do exactly. you like? So then obviously the, the argument will very quickly, I'm sure at any dinner party you're at, uh, I'm sure you're the star of most dinner parties, uh, at any dinner party you're at, like it, I imagine it very quickly turns to, oh yeah, we, well, like we're into quantum computing, which is going to take more energy. We're into VR. We're into like all this stuff that takes a ton of energy. So yeah, I probably am not a guy who's going to say, let's use less energy, but there's other better cleaner sources of energy, green energy, wind, solar, obviously you cover in the book, but for those who haven't read it, I'll let you talk a little bit about that here. Yeah. So, I mean, in general, you want, we always want, I would call energy evolution. So you want energy to evolve in, you know, 
a couple of in a few dimensions. So you want it to be more affordable over time. You want it to be more reliable. You want it to be more versatile, which means it can power every type of machine, including very hard to power machines like airplanes and cargo ships. You want it to be more scalable, so it's available to billions of people in thousands of places. And you want it to be cleaner in the sense of having fewer adverse, you know, emissions or or impacts. So you want those things to happen. And if you look at and, and so I'm all definitely I definitely want alternatives, but they actually have to be cost effective. And you have to think of them in the context of one fact that is not discussed almost ever, which is that the world is desperately short of energy. And this is a good time to bring up the example you mentioned earlier about, you know, you know, about a family or a mother in the Gambia. So just a poor, you know, poor African country where, you know, mother can have a baby you know, premature baby that in the US it would be no problem. You just incubate the baby and, you know, there would be, you'd be a little scared at the time, but you wouldn't even remember it a few months later uh, at versus, but that all depends on the incubator having a constant supply of ultra reliable electricity. But the hospital in the Gambia and the story, but many hospitals around the world doesn't have reliable electricity. So it doesn't even have an incubator. You couldn't even donate one because what's it gonna be powered by? It doesn't have the reliable electricity. And so you just have tragically all these premature babies just dying who would live, who would live somewhere, somewhere else. And you know, same thing with like, uh, you know, an abnormality, like some problem that could be detected in ultrasound and you could do something about it, but you don't recognize it because you don't have these amazing machines that require unreliable electricity. And this is, this is a microcosm of the problem, which is that most of the world is desperately short of energy by our standards. There are 3 billion people who use less electricity individually than one of our refrigerators uses. So you just think about that. I mean, that's, we have a third of the world who's using wood and animal dung to heat their homes and cook their food, you know, which is not an efficient way to do it. And is not, I mean, it's certainly, you know, lots and lots of indoor air pollution. And so when you're thinking about energy and alternatives, you need to think of it as the world needs far more energy. It's often thought of as, oh, we're already using too much energy. So let's just get rid of some of the fossil fuel. But if you think of it as, no, 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 the world needs three, four times more energy, then you should be very suspicious of somebody who says, not just, I want want to explore new alternatives, but I want to get rid of fossil fuels and I promise to replace them with alternatives. And so that's that's the thing that if you want to say at dinner parties, people conflate. They conflate, I'm interested in exploring new alternatives with, I want to forcibly get rid of fossil fuels and I promise these new alternatives will work. And if you look at that, it turns out there's no evidence for that at all. We have fossil fuels provide 80% of the world's energy. They're specifically good at providing things like airplanes, cargo ships, a lot of types of industrial heat. They're totally dominated by fossil fuels, particularly like heavy duty machinery is, fossil fuel use is still growing. And it's growing in the parts of the world that care most about cost effective energy, such as China. So why is China, which is the leading producer by far of solar panels and wind turbines, why are they using coal to do that? Do they not know how amazing solar and wind are? No, they know that fossil fuels are usually the most cost effective way to provide energy. So what restricting that forcibly means is it means we have far less energy than we otherwise would. And we're, this is exactly what's happened with the energy crisis. Just by restricting the growth in fossil fuels, we have Europe afraid of the winter. We have different, you know, all kinds of industrial plants shutting down. We have fertilizer plants shutting down because they can't afford the natural gas, which has been suppressed on the market. Uh, we have, let's say, Bangladesh as an example of they can't compete for natural gas because it's scarce and the price has been driven up. So they have reports of expected blackouts through 2026. It's just this total crisis because of this idea that we can get rid of fossil fuels because all these alternatives can replace them. In reality, there's nothing that can replace fossil fuels. Near term, solar and wind, certainly not because they're fundamentally unreliable. So that means that they can go to near zero at any time. That means they need backup. The backup usually has to be provided by fossil fuels. It definitely does not work to just back them up with batteries. You run the numbers on backing up the world's energy supply with batteries. Elon Musk's best prices is $400 trillion for three days worth of batteries. So this is just all all of these fantasies, but people are using these fantasies to justify taking away people's energy. So the main thing I want to stress, particularly because we have a lot of entrepreneurs in the audience, is there's a life and death difference between saying, hey, I want to explore alternatives on the free market 
versus I want to incrementally ban fossil fuels with the promise that these alternatives will replace them. The first is a good idea. The second is a deadly idea. Yeah, what, I mean, I guess, I imagine one of the big arguments is like, we're, but we're not using enough of it for it to have the exponential benefit or, or the breakthroughs just around the corner. I mean, are those not, is it not possible that Great, we have prove a, it. Okay. Well, I mean, prove it. But so, so this is the thing, like, I mean, if you just took it concretely, so if somebody says, hey, like, I want to power, I have this idea to power all the hospital, the respirators in the hospital with wind turbines. Now, it hasn't worked before. Nobody has ever done this before, but let's try it on your mother. Like, let her be first. And we're going to take away all the fossil fuels. Nobody is going to agree to this. And yet we're agreeing to it as a civilization. So you should be, we should always be suspicious when somebody's supposed replacement involves banning the thing that works and is desperately needed by more people. And, and what you find then is a lot of the people who are doing this and who are advocating getting rid of fossil fuels and making these promises, their arguments are terrible and they make no sense. And, and I refute all of them in fossil future, but, but you have to recognize they're not coming from a good place. So for example, just this idea of like, oh, it's exponential. You know, this is just this very overused and vague term and they're acting like, oh, well, this is the same as microprocessors, right? It's the same as microprocessors as what's gonna happen to solar panels. But if you look at microprocessors, what they're able to do is the basic physics allow you to get more and more work uh, in terms of actual productive output from the same amount of material or less material. Whereas with the solar panel, you, your maximum output is fixed by the amount of energy in sunlight. You cannot expand that. You can expand how much of that you can harness. So let's say you can do 20%, maybe we can do 40% at some point. But it doesn't, it doesn't work like that at all. So everyone who's talking about this as exponential, no, no, no. To get exponentially more sunlight, you need exponentially larger solar panels, which means you need exponentially more of these different mined minerals from the earth which means you need to scale them at a very, very rapid pace. And then of course, there's the issue of how do you actually make them reliable, which if you were to do it just with solar panels would require batteries, which as I said, the prices are so absurd that it's not worth even, even considering that. But you have these charlatans who make these points about like, oh, it's exponential, da, da, da. And the point is, if you really cared about the issue, you would know how hard it is to actually make something work on the market. And you would not advocate this terrible policy of restricting fossil fuels and then delivering the replacement. So it's, and also you see the same movement is usually hostile to nuclear. Like nuclear used to be a much more cost-effective alternative, but the green movement made it so expensive with excessive regulation to the point where it's almost a criminal enterprise to build a new nuclear plant. So again, all of these claims, I always ask like, are you just advocating that we explore this on the free market? Or are you saying we should force this on people and forcibly deprive them of fossil fuels. If you're saying that, I don't trust anything you say. Yeah, I mean, you make very convincing arguments as as you do in the book. And again, I just can't remember them all because it's just it's there's so much. EnergyTalkingPoints.com. Ever they're all in tweet length. So I write uh, long books, and then which you can get. I, I hope you do. But if you want a lot of the arguments for free in tweet length, just go to EnergyTalkingPoints.com. So, so that's great. And again, we're here with Alex Epstein, Fossil Future. Check out the book. Um, Alex, what, why aren't more people talking about this like this? Because it's hard. Like, again, as a general citizen, someone who doesn't spend all my time like you do digging in here very, I mean, you, and we'll talk a little bit about sort of like the level of stringentness you guys use um, to, before you publish data. Like, it's, it's so intimidating because this is such an anti-narrative. Why, why are we here and, and what can each of us do like on a, a regular basis to start maybe normalizing this conversation? Well, so it's, it might not be visible, but it's improving quite a bit right now. And one of the things that's causing it to improve that, that's maybe more obvious is just we have an energy crisis where there's a clear shortage of fossil fuel because what's happening is you look at, say, Joe Biden, he ran on I guarantee you we're going to end fossil fuel. That was one of his main ideas. And now he's you know, running to Venezuela, running to Saudi Arabia, to, like saying, hey, we want more fossil fuel. And he's, you know, say, he's saying, hey, I did nothing to, res to restrict oil, which I think is absurd, but it's notable that because now fossil fuels are being seen as this very valuable thing, at least in the short to medium term, 
people are much more open to arguments that there are benefits. So that's one thing. But I think the, the more important thing, and that is an opportunity because people will be more open to these arguments. You know, when I told people I have a book called Fossil Future coming out, say three years ago, they'd say, well, fossil future, I mean, come on, we don't need a fossil future. We have all these alternatives. And now like, oh wait, that's not working very well for people. So they're open to it. So there's the energy crisis. But then the other thing, and I, I wrote about this on Twitter last week and, and it'll be up soon at energytalkingpoints.com. There's a trend of what I call energy humanists rising. And these are people who think about energy in this big picture benefits and side effects pro-human way. And you're seeing in the last few years, we've had a lot of big books uh, and, and increasingly prominent authors who have this perspective. So I was one of the first with Moral Case in 24, Moral Case for Fossil Fuels in 2014. But in 2020, we had Michael Schellenberger, who's now been on Joe Rogan twice and discussed these issues on that show twice. Uh, he had a book called Apocalypse Never, which has done really well. A guy named Bjorn Lomborg uh, has had a book called False Alarm in 2020, making similar arguments. A physicist who used to work in the Obama administration named Steve Coonan had a book called Unsettled that came out last year, which is making similar arguments. And then I have Fossil Future coming out this year, which has done really well uh, as well. And so you're just, and then if you look on Twitter, which I, I'm on all the time and it, it, it's a gauge of things, you're seeing there's a rise of these voices, you know, seeing new voices from Africa, from India, uh, the financial world. There's a, there's a cool new um, kind of sub stack called Doomberg where they've been exploding in the last couple of years. There's these interesting like analysts like Lynn Alden and uh, uh, I forget her last name, but Tracy Chi, she goes by on Twitter and some, I don't want to leave everyone out, but there's, what you're seeing is it's so much like when I first kind of met you in the genius network and strategic coach space, let's say in 2014, 2015, like it was so much of a lonelier position and now it's growing. Now it's still, it is, it, and hopefully it's exponential. It's one of these things where it's still small, but you're seeing it rise. For example, the wall street journal is just saturated with these ideas right now. They're just always kind of making these points, whereas they weren't doing it in the past. So I'm very happy of my role, which is fairly significant in terms of leading this line of thinking and being one of the pioneers of it. And it's exciting that it's happening. And in terms of people spreading it, it's really easy, actually. You just have to share resources that you know, energy humanists create and just recommend them to other people, particularly influential people. So one way to do it is fossil future if you want to get Bulk copies, you can get them at fossilfuture.com. Uh, but this website, energytalkingpoints.com, is great because it's free and it has articles and everything, and you can share them. And it really just, it's really as simple as share the best stuff with influential people. I know you're like, you've shared stuff with certain influential people that has, you know, I think directly helped me. I, one of my main things is just anytime I meet anyone interesting, I think I did this for you. Like, I'll just send them a signed copy of the book. That's a lot of my assistant's job is just send signed copies of the book to people who ask for it. And so it's just, it's amazing how much, because the thing is these arguments, they're really powerful and the other side doesn't really have a good answer to them. So when people are exposed to them, particularly in today's climate, intellectual climate, they are very open. And the more it gets normalized, the, the less of this kind of reflexive, oh, that's a climate change denier, blah, blah, you know, all these false things, people can't get away with that anymore. There's really like, no way you can be a climate change believer and be pro fossil fuels if you're truly pro human in your thinking. So it's really like share the best resources with people, including influential people. And it is really growing right now. And now is the perfect opportunity because we have a crisis that's really waking people up to the importance of this issue. You got that. Um, these are, look, you guys do a lot of research. Tell us a little bit about your think tank. Tell us how difficult it is to fully vet and how far you go with vetting an argument before you want to present it. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that you'll notice if you look at people who attempt to this, let's just take fossil future, like the people who are trying to deal with it, who are trying to attack it is the main thing. So the, the main strategies are ignore it. So that's still the dominant strategy, even though it's gotten a lot of attention and sold a lot of books. So the dominant strategy is pretend these arguments don't exist. Because if you're in the establishment, you can get away with that for a little while longer. It's starting to become, it's not going to work long term, but they're, they're still trying that. Uh, the other strategy, another strategy is attack me personally. So if people search um, 
if they search energytalkingpoints.com and they search Washington Post, it'll there's this whole saga where they, of all things, tried to portray me as a racist before the book came out, even though I'm a lifelong individualist. And their argument was, you should ignore this book because Alex Epstein is a racist, so he doesn't care about poor people in other countries. So you should argue, you shouldn't even pay attention to his argument about poor people in other countries, which this is the stupidest thing I could ever imagine that this is your argument against my views. But it just shows they're just trying to discredit me personally so that you ignore my argument that they have no refutation of, which is that poor people in Africa and India and parts of Asia and Latin America clearly need more fossil fuels. So there's that kind of thing. And that, that fortunately, I was able to preempt and, and it worked in my favor. So people can study that example. Um, so, but the other thing is the fallacy of the straw man which is just like, oh, this is a climate change denier. Or sometimes they'll say, Alex thinks we should only use fossil fuels forever and he hates alternatives. It's like I have a fetish for fossil fuels or something like that, which is just you know bizarre if you understand uh, my methodology. So uh, there's like, that's, there's this, th that's what people do. But in terms of, um, in terms of where we, like what we do on our end, what you'll notice is that you don't see a lot of people finding anything that I'm wrong about in terms of facts. And I think people have caught two errors so far in Fossil Future that I both publicly acknowledge and will correct in subsequent editions, but they're, they're small. They don't address, they're, they're like, oh, I, you know, like, oh, I got this percentage of energy in a hospital wrong or something like that. It's not, not anything substantive about how I represent climate issues or something like that. And that should show you something that people have a big interest in attacking me. And yet I so rarely get attacked on facts, look at what I say on Twitter. And it's mostly people are just like, either they'll praise us, say, can you believe this BS? But they they have so little to say. And one reason is because I have very, very good researchers, particularly a guy named Stefan Henna from Germany that I discovered on Facebook like 11 years ago, just randomly. I could just tell he was smart and he's just super detail oriented. If people listening know the Colby scores, he's a very high fact finder. Uh, so that means you're just very, very, let's just say diligent to put it nicely. Uh, about accuracy. And so he catches so much of the stuff before. And so that's one thing is thinking, just getting all the facts right. And he catches much more of my stuff that's wrong than any opponent of mine does. But then the other thing is just thinking through the arguments, like thinking through this complex issue to make it simple is so hard. So I just spent, after I had a really big book, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, I kind of reread it and I was thinking of updating it. And then I just thought this could be so much clearer there's, so I just did a whole new book on the same topic. And it the first one took me six, six months, and this took me three years. And just the degree of difficulty is, I, I, no one would ever go through it if they unless they just loved the topic, because it's just so hard to think, if you're really trying to be right, to think through everything to the point where you're convinced of it and you think you can explain it to somebody who expects to disagree. So like if people check out Fossil Future, I think you'll see there's a there's a very unusual level of just step-by-step -step precision, starting with somebody who expects to disagree and like leading them for 400 pages to, you should actually become a champion of more fossil fuels. And it is, it's worth it, but it, it it is a lot of work. And I would just say, we really, really care about being right. And it's the opposite of the caricature. People think, oh, like the fossil fuel industry found you and made you a champion. Like none of that happened at all. I came to all these things before I met anyone from that industry, let alone had any financial relationship, but it's really, it's really like we know, we have a very deep conviction that we were right about this issue. And that that actually leads to such an obligation to explain it persuasively in a world that doesn't agree, because it really feels like if we can't explain this persuasively, nobody else will. And then the world will continue to make bad decisions. And we will have not like, we won't have done what was possible to stop that and to lead it to make better decisions. Yeah, and so uh, they tried to attack your character. You said it's trumped up some sort of, I assume, fake racism thing that they they brought to the to light. Like, what? How, how has this cost you personally? Are there like, you know, are there parties you don't get invited to anymore because it's just <laughs> such an unpopular viewpoint? No, no. So I would say it's it's incredibly profited me personally, and I want to stress this because I want to encourage people to be realistic about the downsides of having controversial views and then the and be realistic about the upsides because i think people often vastly overestimate the downsides 
and underestimate the upsides. Now, this is more true to the extent that you are focused on something. Let's say if you work at Google and it's your first day on the job and they have some climate policy and you walk around with signs saying, hey, this is going to kill a lot of poor people. Yeah, maybe that, okay. Th like you have to think about that kind of thing when you're in a giant corporate bureaucracy. But if you just take the pure example of, okay, I'm a champion of fossil fuels, how does this affect me? I mean, I get tons of positive feedback all the time. And the negative feedback I get is occasionally right in some way, and then it helps me improve my thinking. It's usually just a joke in terms of it has no content at all. And so for me, if you don't give me any content and you say I'm wrong, that's like a kid making fun of me for not believing in Santa Claus. It just has no effect on me whatsoever. And in terms of get, not getting invited to parties, it's not like I was the most popular person before. Uh, it's just... You, and you, you meet so many interesting people through it and get so much positive feedback. And I, every profession you can imagine is interested in these ideas. When I meet people, even I live in Southern California, which you might think is hostile, people are interested all the time. My neighbors, I tried to hide what I do just because I don't like getting in excessive discussions because I like to think during the day and I work at home. But now they all know, and a lot of them are, are fans of it and stuff. So it's actually really good, particularly in the modern world with the internet, because if as long as you have a healthy attitude toward criticism, where you only care about it, if it really has validity, and that's a whole subject of how to get there. But if you can get to that place, and then you're, you're kind of eager for the criticism where you can improve, because we all can improve, and there's no reason to suspect, we should never expect that we did everything perfectly at the beginning. So if you can get to that place where you enjoy the positive, it's amazing with the modern internet. I'll, I'll give you a contrast. When I was a sophomore at Duke, so this was in 20, no, 1999, I had a column called The Voice of Reason at Duke. And to my recollection, I got 59 negative letters to the editor and zero positive. But there wasn't, you know, there wasn't even Facebook back then. It was hard to find people's email addresses. So I got almost no positive feedback. For whatever reason, that didn't deter me too much. But compared to that, the modern internet is, is absolute paradise because I get nice people emailing me and messaging me all the time and all this encouragement, and it's amazing. So I, th I think that having controversial views, if you express them, see, you, you have to argue for them in very, in very sensible ways. I think that that's the key, is you, if you have controversial conclusions, but you come across as somebody who's thinking carefully and, and really concerned about the truth versus just spewing things to get people upset or agitated in some other way, like I can't speak to that, but if if you really have good reasons for your views and they're controversial, it's it's incredibly uh, rewarding. So I would I would encourage people to do it and don't have any sympathy for me, and and don't hold yourself back as much as you might be now. That's wow, that's great. Um, but you have to be willing to do the work. I, I love what you said. There's a lot of lessons in there. You got to be you got to be willing to sort of desensitize yourself from the positive negative emotions of criticism and dig into them and see are they you know are they merited or not and if they are you have to learn i, I imagine what you're saying is or well, it is absolutely true that if you are seeking constructive criticism when you actually find it it's like finding a diamond you're like oh my gosh this is something that makes me better at what i do and i can use it but that's a very different way of looking at criticism than most people would just think the more criticism the the worse i'm going to feel as opposed <laughs> then, to then don't do that then, and you see these celebrities saying, Hey, you know, like I get for every hunt, if I get one bad comment and a hundred good comments, it ruins my week. I'm like, Oh my God, how could you? But, but I mean, another perspective on this is you really don't want to have your life oriented so that other people's opinions about things, positive or negative, are the thing that matters most to you. And you know, one of my favorite books is The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand, which I think really, really displays this in action. If, if anyone reads that book, I think you'll see Steve Jobs talked about this as well. Like how, as he went on, just the positive and negative meant less to him. And what you really get is you have a vision, you know, you kind of have a vision of this would be a really cool thing to create. And it would be, I would love doing it and it will be valuable. I think it'll be valuable to people. So you care if it's valuable to people. You're not indifferent, like, oh, I'm just gonna write my music and who cares if anyone likes it. But it's it's like, you think of it as I wanna, I think it'll be valuable a lot of people. I wanna create it, but at the end, it's, you really have to be satisfied internally 
that you did your vision. And then, yeah, you need validation from the market that it was valuable. So let's say, you know, fossil future selling a lot of copies, that's part of it. But the main satisfaction is really believing in it and achieving it. And again, other people actually valuing it as part of the achievement. But the main thing is like you enjoy creating it and you're, you're proud yourself of what it is. And that's just, that's so much more enjoyable than anyone else's feedback. So if you're still in the mode and it's understandable where like somebody says, oh, Alex is brilliant. And that's like, that means a lot or Alex is an idiot. And that doesn't mean something or it means a lot. Like you just don't want to be in that place because it just ultimately other people, there is no guarantee whatsoever that what is in their head has anything to do with reality. So you need to decide for yourself what you think reality is. And then if you value, if you decide other people are good judges, yeah, it's great to get affirmed by them. But, but the people who view it as the goal in life is to be affirmed by other people. And like the greatest thing would be somebody saying, I'm a genius and this is the greatest work ever. Like if, if you're in that place, you are going to be wrecked by the negatives. And it's, uh, it's I do jujitsu and there's a, a kind of a thing in jujitsu where like people, they say like, hey, you got to learn to be okay with losing. But part of being okay with losing is you don't, you don't take winning that seriously either. It's just kind of like your goal is to get better and better and better by your own standards and you enjoy that. And yeah, you'd rather win than lose. But in both cases, you're getting better. Winner doesn't mean you're some god and losing doesn't mean you're a loser. It basically just means the circumstances were a little bit different you know, with your opponent and whatever else is going on. So if, like, if you can love the process and have your own vision and be proud of achieving that, you're going to be so much ha happier. So that's my little soapbox on, on this love, issue since you raised it. No matter what you think about uh, the fossil future, that's great advice for everyone. Uh, Alex, so what's next? You've got the book out. You're promoting the book. Uh, obviously, we encourage people to get the book, Fossil Future. Uh, what's the website again they can go to for the talking points? EnergyTalkingPoints.com. That's excellent. EnergyTalkingPoints.com. And then what's, what's next for you from here? I mean, are you, where, what are you doing next? Uh, so I have a couple of things I'm doing. So in the energy realm, my number one focus is actually political, which people often advise against because they say oh, politics is terrible. But I'm very interested always in my ideas being practical. So I started this thing, Energy Talking Points, a, a couple of years ago. And the goal was to take my ideas about like what's right, including what policies are right, and be able to boil them down very, very concisely so that elected officials could use them and hopefully, hopefully implement them. So that's been really successful. Uh, you, if you go to that website, energytalkingpoints.com, we have a weekly newsletter where you get new talking points on some important issue every Wednesday. You can get it all free. And, and I work with like 170 plus offices now. So I have people who are part of my group. I advise different people. I'm not a lobbyist or anything like that. It's just people who work with me because they think it's valuable. So we have that. And my project there is I'm working on what's called an energy freedom platform, which you can also see at energytalkingpoints.com, where it's trying to give politicians a positive agenda. So not just criticizing today's policies, but here's what's a positive uh, agenda. And another project I work on that might be interesting to some of your viewers is in a seemingly unrelated thing, I have an app, uh, which is like a new, it's kind of a new social media platform called Thoughtful. And there's a lot to it, but basically the, the number one thing Thoughtful can do for you right now is it gives you a place where you can take all the thoughtful content that you know about, plus there's a community of people who are recommending only things they think are good. It puts it all in one place. And so basically you have a go-to place where everything is good and nothing is trash. And so if you go to Thoughtful and you can just get, use my invite link, thoughtful.community slash Alex, what you'll find is you can just say, hey, I want to set a goal of spending, you know, 45 minutes on good stuff versus bad stuff and or, you know, 20 minutes or whatever it is. And, and it will really change your life because you're going to learn about so many interesting ideas that are good and you're going to be insulating yourself from so much trash. So Thoughtful eventually is going to be an amazing place to discuss ideas. It's going to have a lot of other stuff, but right now it's this really amazing haven where you can spend a lot more time on content that benefits your life and a lot less on content that wastes your life. So again, you can sign up. It's all free at thoughtful.community slash Alex. 
Love it. We have gone very wide, but not very deep on a lot of things. I encourage everybody to not write off these ideas as tinfoil hat ideas. They certainly are not. There's been a lot of there's been a lot of research put into them. We didn't get to cover it all, but I encourage people to read the book Fossil Future. You, if nothing else, you'll be impressed at the level of depth that Alex goes to make these uh, these his case, which is very compelling. Uh, Alex, man, I appreciate you joining us, talking all about it, and I truly hope that some of you will take the time to dig in. I hope all of you will take the time to dig in. And and if nothing else, think about the way everything is framed. I think there's not a single person I talk to on a daily basis who wouldn't agree that you know we're being led by narratives, one way or the other. We just choose to believe certain ones and choose to reject others. But I think it's super hopeful, and I admire people like you who take the time to, to dig in on something, go deep, think about the way we approach it, and then think about how we might discuss it in a way that's more productive than just going along with the narrative. So Alex, thanks a ton for joining us. And uh, thanks, uh, Nick. I wish you great success with the book, man. Hey, Nick Nanton here, and thanks for tuning in to Now to Next. I want to make sure you don't miss a single episode of this show on YouTube, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, just go into your settings and switch on notifications. Thanks for watching.